welcome back to another episode of Over the Glass. I am your host, Jay. And I am your host, Drew. And today, I guess Drew's just going to give us some updates on, on the Canucks. <sighs> I don't know if I want to do that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> It's been it's been a it's been a shaky go for us here lately. Like I feel like to an extent way after the uh I feel like ever since All Stars, just a little bit. You guys have been yeah. a little rocky. Yeah, and I, I I feel like there's maybe some I feel like some people are maybe freaking out a little bit too aggressively about it. But like if you were to look before the All Star break, it wasn't trending in a very good direction then. Like we hadn't lost four games like we did after the All Star break, but we weren't blowing people out either right these were all like one goal victories sometimes in overtime sometimes overtime losses so i don't know we kind of got like woke up for a little bit we got a little bit of a win streak back and now it's a nine game homestand and we're one one and one on it through the first three games (laughs) listen we can't have it all and i could do without the president's trophy is what i keep reminding myself of um if we don't get that cursed thing i'll be all right but but Jay, I know, I know you appreciate the Captain Quinnith and Hughes, Quinner, Quintany, and uh, McQuincy, man, Quincy, Quincino. <laughs> I uh, this kid, like, what a beast! Um, just last night, yes, and another loss uh, <laughs> um, to the Capitals. Quinn Hughes set the franchise record for most points in a single season by a Canucks defenseman with 77 points. There's still 14 games left to go in the season, and he's already de- already up there with 77 points, so plenty of time still left to work. The crazy thing about this stat in particular that I really, really enjoy knowing is that he broke the previous record, which was 76 points which he set in 2022, 2023. So he set that last season. And then the season before that, the 2021-22 season, he set the first record since like the 70s, I think it was. It was like Doug Lid- Lidster, 68 points. So for the last three years in, in Canucks franchise history, Quinn Hughes has both set and broke the franchise record for single points or single points in a single season by a Canucks defenseman. And, um, you know, I just think that's cool because not too long ago, there was somebody saying that he was, what, a 3B, a 3C defenseman, whatever that weird thing was. He was a third tier guy. And uh, I don't know, man, if you're breaking records like that, you're setting them, you're breaking them, you're setting them, breaking them for fun. Just like, it's like that scene in SpongeBob where he like, he's like, you want to see me run fast? And he doesn't move. He's like, you want to see me do it again? Like, uh, you know. I put some respect on Quinn Hughes's name. That's all I'm saying. He's uh, he's doing things repeatedly. <laughs> so Nessa isn't here today, but I I I will go out on a limb, and I I, I think this is a this is a Quinn Hughes stan podcast because I know that Jack Hughes is Nessa's favorite of the Hughes brothers, but um, Jack who Luke who. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, all of them, all of them are such unreal talents. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the mm-hmm. Hughes boys are just, I mean, all of them. But it's its funny. It's really funny for me to see the hype around Jack. And then Quinn has been all clearly doing this consecutively. And there's still talk about, well, he's not a very good defensive defenseman. He's not very good defensively. And it's like, I don't know. He's a defenseman, and he has, like, one of the highest plus-minus ratings in the league right now. So it seems to me like he is very apt at what he does on the blue line and the way that he can literally break dudes' ankles like it's a a fashion statement. Like, it's just for funsies. Like, I'm going to do this toe drag and do a little cute little spin and work my edges and then, boop, pass it across the crease. Look at that. Another assist. I just put some respect on Quinn's name. That's all I ask. So I'll ask for the rest of the hockey world. Look, I get that defenseman. It's in it's in the name. It's in the position that your your priority is defense. But as a whole, defense is everybody's priority. That is the defense first. Yes, 
That is the very first thing that you should be thinking about when you're out on the ice. You need to defend your territory. Um, and, you know, as a Sharks fan, we're very familiar with these offensive defensemen who are not really good at defense. We we have had notable Brent Burns, a North Trophy winner. We've had our dearly departed to the, the Penguins, um, Eric Carlson, who put up a amazing season last season with a severely terrible Sharks team. So there's a lot of benefits to having somebody who, you know, like, okay, fine. Not everybody can be a Kale McCarr, okay? But, you know, that's why there's other people on the roster. That's why you guys went out and, like, got, you know, moved some pieces around to help out, you know, on the blue line, among other places and on your roster. That's why the, the Leafs keep, you know, they're, they're – um, Time and time again, it's been noted that the Leafs are struggling at defense and they are constantly trying to fill in the holes. And it looked like they did. And then that guy got injured and now they're scrambling again. So I get that the, a defenseman who's who excels at defense is still very important to, to the game, but like... Everyone loves seeing goals being scored, so step off Quinn already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think it's I just think it's egregious to say he doesn't have a defensive game. Like the way people talk about Quinn is if he has like he's a complete puck moving defenseman. That's just what he does best. Mm. Right? But like he's great at closing the gap and closing the check and getting sticks in and grinding people out along the boards and fighting for puck possession down in the ozone. He's great at the zone entries and the zone exits. So is it, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know. Would you rather him be a good defensive defenseman and him play in his own D, D zone all game? Or would you rather be him really good at shutting down the play and moving the puck and getting the puck down the ice and eventually, hopefully, into the back of the net somehow. I mean, I would just rather have a good defenseman who is able to clear the zone and hopefully create somewhat the rest of the play rather than just a like a one faucet. Like he's really good when we're on our zone. I understand having defensemen that serve that purpose, right? Of being really good shut down in your own zone defensemen. I just think it's wild to like put the perspective of Quinn Hughes as like that's who he's. He, he he doesn't have that style of game at all. Like he's he's like the complete opposite of somebody that can shut down plays in their own end. It's just like you no, know, he shuts them down, and then he's like to the ozone we go, which I think is fine. That's fine. That's what he does. That's why he's good. You know. Um, isn't I? And maybe you can help me with this, but I feel like I've seen that people talk about how McDavid doesn't really do defense. Yeah. I've seen that talk too. But why is why is no one being like, well, at McDavid about that? Is it because he's like scoring a bunch of goals and getting a ton of points and they're like, oh, well, we can overlook that. But, you know, this Quinn guy, no, we've got to be way more harsh on him. I can't, I, I have never been in the province of Alberta, but I do know that I have a deep disdain for their hockey teams as a Canucks fan because of the discourse that surround them. Like, like he's not literally Jesus. He's not literally hockey Jesus. You can absolutely criticize McDavid and, and the holes in his game. Like, I, for one, think that McDavid plays like a little bit like a goon because he's a superstar and he knows he can get away with some of the low cheap shots that he does. But yeah, there's absolute whole, I mean, just because he can burn you down 200 feet ice and dipsy doodle through two defensemen, like he still, there still needs to be, I think if you're going to be really like an, a superstar, you still have to have a complete game, right? Like you have to be able to show up and your skills have to be utilized in whatever way they're going to be utilized best, whether that's at the defensive end of the ice or the, or the offensive end of the ice. So yeah, yeah, I I won't, I won't say too much about the, the sometimes double standard of of McJesus in particular, but he is absolutely capable of being picked apart for his defensive game. Just saying. Look, there's three there's three Hughes brothers. I'm sure you could find something else about the other two to pick on. Quinn's doing things here. Like, how much more of the stat sheet do you guys need to realize? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Okay. 
I have to mention it only because as we keep talking about the Hughes brothers, I remembered a, the game with the Devils against the Ducks about like a couple weeks back. Um, Jack, I, I think I think the Ducks must have won that because Jack got really heated at one point. And I don't remember the player that he uh, clashed with, but they won't. They both went to the box, and uh, the camera zoomed in to Jack while he was like, you know, chirping at the other dude, and he was saying to the other guy, like people reading like his his mouth, saying that like people people want people pay to watch me play. <laughs> And now that's turned into a meme every time that the devils lose. I don't like that's oh. just so bad. It's just so bad. See, I, I mean, I agree. I, I agree with Jack on that. He ain't wrong. People do pay to watch that boy play hockey. But Him people and his have been using it now when they lose. They're like, and I think. Oh, I think. Um, it came from the official social media of the Anaheim Ducks. That game when the Ducks won, and they memed it. That's, I think I think I think they put like Dostal uh people come people pay to watch Dostal win or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, I seen the post. I seen the post. That's like you have to be so careful. Players have to be so careful when you like chirp and you kind of <laughs> because as a Canucks fan, I've learned those kind of comments come back so fast. Like whenever whenever we beat the Kings, I think it was the 20 I could be wrong. Start of the 2019 season, maybe the 2018 season. And we beat LA like it was like eight to two. And Drew Doughty was like, I can't believe we got beat by a team like that. And then the Canucks were like, Team like that, let's put it on shirts. And so quickly <laughs> did that illusion crumble. And I'm like, I will never, like, if somebody says something and people are like, let's make it a team slogan, I'm like, the only team that that seems to have worked for in any capacity was the Carolina Hurricanes. And now that I'm thinking about it, I can't even remember what their thing was. <laughs> I just know it worked for them. Like, it's typically a sign. Of a bad omen. So Jack's not wrong, but that's he should have never said that on camera because now, <laughs> now it people play to watch me pay is Jack's team like that, and he's just gonna have to get through it. <laughs> but just going back a bit to Quinn Hughes, because I did want to point out there was this uh uh moment during one of the last couple of games where he got a penalty and he was he was whining his ass all the way to the box and the ref was like get in the box please box now please <laughs> and i said to two of my friends be like i'm dying because this is like how i talk to my dog sit down go over there please down good boy this is just like Dude, the best thing about that too was like the ref's in there and he's like, Fox, please now. And Quinn's like, he always looks dejected, but he's sitting there with like his head completely like, he's like, and just like complete defiance, but like his shoulders are slouched and his like sticks on the ground. He looks like he's being told that he's being grounded for six months, like to the box until the end of the season, <laughs> Quinn. Do what I say. The beautiful in game. In the box now, please. <laughs> just. <laughs> Don't argue with me. <laughs> Stop arguing with your <sighs> ref dad. <laughs> oh, it made me think like refs refs are just refs are just babysitting these these players. That's all it is. I mean, you would have, I mean, if anybody looks at that clip, it looks like Quinn Hughes just lost his best friend and was told that he could never play video games again until he graduated <laughs> high school. His body language is like super like being grounded by my dad <laughs> energy. <laughs> Give me your phone. No. <laughs> oh, the good old days when being grounded was the worst thing to happen to you. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> I was trying to make out through that whole clip because it sounds like Quinn's still trying to argue with him. And I was trying to make out exactly like what Quinn's like arguing about. It sounds like something about where the puck is at. But I just love that the ref is like on the hype mic having like none of it. He's just like to the box. Now, to the box, kid. Like, we're not arguing about it. I'm the ref, you're the player. <laughs> Poor Quinn. <laughs> you had to go to the timeout box. All right. So I wanted to talk a bit about... We, we've been talking about this a little bit 
over the last couple of weeks. And um, I don't remember what I said the last time we talked about this, but I, I'm sure it it had something to do with me being concerned with the future of Matt Rempe on the New York Rangers, given that he this first handful of games in the NHL and within that time frame, he'd been in more fights in that time than he actually had ice time. Um, and I was concerned about it because it's like all these like quote unquote enforcers just seem to be lining up to take, you know, their, you know, their round with him, like at every game that the Rangers would, would be playing that team. Um, and during the trade deadline, the New Jersey Devils picked up Curtis McDermott. And I initially, I was like, why? <laughs> Purpose? I don't know. But I was like, okay, I don't, I don't follow the Devils that closely. So I guess they have their reasons and it makes sense. <laughs> this is something that I feel like is starting to leave our sport. It it won't go without kicking and screaming. But I I feel like it, it's it's an era that is is dying out. Is this and the sharks have done this too in the past, where they've got one guy that they pick up for the sole purpose of being like the dude who like you know, sets the tone and like, we'll drop the gloves and we'll, you know, quote unquote, protect the, the players. And I get that it's a complicated conversation. I'm not saying that, that the, that the players reactions to certain things is entirely their fault. We know that when certain things happen, the, the, the depart department of player safety just doesn't seem to take it very seriously or they just give it a slap on the wrist. And then obviously that upsets certain players. Like, you know, if, if a player's out for a while, you know, and then they, and then they circle that game on their calendar for that, that team that took out that guy and they, they make, and everyone makes this whole storyline, you know, leading up to it and everything. Um, so I get that it's complicated, but it's still something at the end of the day, like all these different corners of this level of the sport need to address the fact that you can't have this guy just going out there, dropping the gloves, getting his face beat in for like every other game. And I, and I feel like leading up to this suspension, I want to say that the New York Rangers um, coaching staff did kind of have a little bit of a talk with Rempe because as if you notice after those five times that he'd been in a fight, he was no longer like just jumping right into a fight. Um, the game against the Devils, McDermott was pretty much out there the entirety of his time trying to get into a fight with Rempe. And there, there were certain clips that were circulating. I didn't get to actually like watch the entirety of the game, but the clips that were out there, he'd like come up to Rempe. He'd be, you know, cross-checking him a bit, you know, in the arm, probably saying like, you know, let's go, blah, 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 and whatever. Like Rempe just kind of looking at him like, yeah, no, I'm going to go over here now. And like, you know, people being like, oh, that's, like, how dare Rempe, like, not drop the gloves, like, oh, and trying to say that, like, he's the guy that, like, you know, is so disrespectful and whatever. And I'm like, what? You guys are all kind of weird. Anyways, um, but so Rempe, the suspension part was when Rempe took a hit at, I believe it was Siegenthaler. And he was going for a hit. And I think we've discussed this before in a previous episode, given his height, he's six foot seven, I want to say, just like giant giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he, one of the previous games, he had gone in for a hit 
and it looked like it was going to be, you know, a good hit. But given his size, he ended up hitting the dude in the face. And it's like, I get it. You're taller than these players. It's a bit of a disadvantage for you to try to play like a clean game if that's what you are honestly trying to do. But yeah, you hit the guy in the head. It, it's got to be a penalty. It's got to be, you know, something's got to happen, you know, because we're trying to come down um, and eliminate these these head contact hits. Um, but this one, he ended up like last second, his elbows went up. And some people were saying, you know, they were headed towards the boards. He was probably, you know, raising them to like brace for his own impact. Who's to say? I don't know if I believe that entirely. I just know that at the end of the day, it's like you can't raise your elbows up because one of his elbows ended up hitting Siegenthaler in the head. Siegenthaler's out with concussion right now. He ended up, uh, Rempe got, I, I believe, a, a game ejection, a major. And then the next day, uh, Department of Player Safety comes out with the, with the four games assessed for his suspension. and. You know, there's arguments on all different sides. Um, but I guess before I get more into my opinion, like what are your kind of thoughts um, related to just as we continue to have this Matt Rempe discussion? You know, I because we've talked about Rempe with his with the fights and the concern over um, condoning goonery. You know, I mean, I think for as evolved as some of the discussions that, and we've had this this chat before, as, some, as evolved as some of the discussions are about hockey and toughness and fighting and, and their places in the sport and when they're applicable and they're not applicable and the politics and nuances of the code and, and all of that, um, I, I, going off of this hit alone, like just looking at this hit, if I came in with no like knowledge of Rempe's history, I mean, yeah, it's hard to argue that like I mean, like you were saying, you have to keep your you have to keep your arms down, you have to keep your elbows down. It's hard to argue that he was bracing himself for his own collision with the boards. He brings his elbows up a good still a good what ten feet at you know six, seven, eight, nine, ten feet away from Siegenthaler. And then nails him right in the face. And I think that goes back to, I think this is a great sort of example of when people hype up this sort of goonery, whether it's serving a purpose on the, the Rangers roster or not, you have guys that eventually, whether it's through some sort of subconscious, like I'm going out there and this is how I'm going to rile people up, where you're consciously looking to put these big hits on people to get under people's skin. You, you kind of give the green light, right, for these players to go out there and I don't want to say cause a scene, but to do things that might be borderline. Like they could be questionable one way or the other, and you've now made it you've, – you've co-opted this sort of like cutthroat go out there and do something physical to this other team. Like don't worry about any other skill set. Just go out there and hit something. I get that there's players that are – I don't want to say design, but that's their role. They go out there, they hit the body, they play a physical game, they rough and tumble. It's it's hard to say this uh, and and mean it in any controversial way. And I don't think it's controversial. I think it's easy to say, and I say that because I know people are like, well, that's just not true. Hockey has evolved past that point of like where we just need to be physical just to be physical, where we need to be physical just to send a message like if that's how your team has adapted to showing an opponent or out strengthening out strengthening their opponent um they're most assuredly gonna have a hard time playing against guys like Connor mcdavid right the fast guys the guys that bring skill the quinn uses the guys that can walk the tightrope to walk the blue line right like hockey itself has evolved way past a more physical nature and then just get out there and take the body and throw a hit and be a goon. And I think when you start co-opting the way that everybody was co-opting Matt Rimpe's like hunting for a fight attitude, it inevitably at some point leads to this. And not necessarily saying that it's going to be Rimpe that throws a hit, 
But that paints a target on his back. And who's to say that, I mean, as normally the way it goes is these kind of guys that get out here and cause trouble for everybody else, they're normally the ones that end up getting targeted somewhere down the line, right? And then the cycle continues because somebody gets retribution against Rempe. And now, you know, I mean, like, I know that the, he had a bout against, um, I can't remember who he went to blows with in the stadium series against New Jersey, right? But now you've got Rempe suspended for another hit on a, on a Devils player after they had a whole big blowout on the stadium series. So now you've just... Like, is it good for storylines and entertainment? Yeah, maybe. But when you've started to co-opt it to the point where it's just like, okay, this is what we've set as expectations for this player. Inevitably, these things happen. And it gets to a point where if you don't stamp it out ahead of time, it gets really out of control really, really quickly. And to say that I was surprised in any regard when I seen that Mad Rippe was suspended, that would be a lie. Because it just seemed like it was a matter of time before something was going to happen to this kid that lined up with being physical at an in, at a time where it wasn't really appropriate to be so, right? Like, it's not just a, putting yourself in jeopardy. You're part of a team. You're also jeopardizing anything that your team has going on. I don't know the particular situation where the Rangers and Devils were in this game, but um, – most coaches would say, like, don't – I mean, I think it's pretty common sense. Don't take a useless penalty, right? Don't put your guys on the disadvantage. So I think it's just – it's an inevitable turn of events getting up to this point. And I, I wish I could say that I was surprised, but I think when you start backing the more goon elements of this game, these things happen. And that's – and it's wild to me that we will co-opt it because it's exciting for these few weeks, but then the rest of the discussion around the culture of the sport is how we have to do better at policing it. You have to pick – you have to pick a side. And and I think Matt Rippe is a good case study of what happens when we say, yeah, let loose, kid. Inevitably, these things are going to happen. Yeah, so – When that hit happened, you know, McDermott was obviously trying to, to get at Rempe there. And Rempe, I – like, people were laughing and, and and also noting that, like, we – yes, we acknowledge that the, the hit is bad and everything, but, like, Rempe was um, trying to taunt McDermott because he was being held by back by the refs and he was waving at him as he was getting escorted off the ice. Like, I don't know how I feel about that part only because it was the aftermath of, of him knocking out somebody. And I'm not sure if he like has any remorse or can actually like comprehend that, or if it's just like in the moment where he's just, you know, in the emotional part of the game as, you know, quote, as they like to say, oh, I just got so emotional that, oops, I almost, you know, committed a murder. Um, you know, um, so I'm not sure still. I want to like this guy because it's from what I've been told, he actually has more to his game than this side that we've been seeing. And I want this young guy who, you know, could potentially have a, you know, a, a, a spot in, in this, in this Rangers lineup for, you know, for future seasons. I want him to not have this as his thing, as his yeah. like, you know, uh, purpose in, in the lineup. Um, but like after the game, McDermott was, you know, interviewed and I just like, I could not, I could not read these quotes from the interview because it's the same shit that we hear from the same type of player that, you know, and it's like the things he was saying, obviously he was saying, you know, like that he shouldn't have done that to Siegenthaler. Uh, but then he starts going on about how, like, there's a code and you need to answer the bell. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> the moment they start, you know, they're, they're, it's like it's like some pamphlet that they get for, like, the enforcers, you know, like, club that they have or whatever they hand it out. And it's like, this is what you say. You know, it's like their own little, like, I don't want to say cult that's a bit too, like, extreme. But it's like this, this, like, 
this club. Yeah, this club that they have where they're just like preaching the 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 good word of the the hockey bro code and whatever and I'm just like the moment you start getting into that like pamphlet, you know, indoctrination type of thing, I I stop listening to you. Like please shut up. Just please shut up. And especially given the fact that Mc- it's not like McDermott has a clean record. Like, bro, you've been suspended for similar things. So it's like, please shut up. Right. Just shut up. Your whole purpose out on that ice that day was to drop the gloves with this dude. So, like, please shut up. Um, and because I was seeing this Rempe stuff on socials and it kind of ended up because I was engaging with it, it started showing me more about this stuff. And I started getting some of like, I was getting like the New York Rangers side and I was getting the devil side and like neither one of them seemed like there was a mixing of people who were like beyond, beyond like logical thought of how we should handle this situation and people being like, Oh, that's why like no one likes these Rangers fans because X, Y, Z. And I'm like, "Eh, you guys are pretty terrible too. Like, let's not (laughs) like everyone's trying to make it seem like, Oh, this is why my fan base is better. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're all, everyone's pretty terrible. There are some terrible people in the sharks fan base as well. Um, But I guess I want to kind of get your thoughts about, you know, so people were upset about it. And then I started seeing, People being like, and and I've had this thought too. And at the end of the day, it it really doesn't make any sense. And the the league would never go for this. But people are like, oh well, uh, leading up to the potential of how many games suspension he would get, people are like, well, he should just get suspended for as many games as Siegenthaler is out. Hmm. I. You know, the first time I ever heard I ever heard that comment was uh, the Nathan Horton hit in the 2011 playoffs that left Horton, like, I believe it was Rafi Torres that, that threw that hit. No, it was Aaron Rome. It was Aaron Rome that threw that hit in the 2011 Cup Final. And the argument came up from the Bruins fans about keeping because Romer got I I could like Google it, but I can't even remember. It was a ridiculous at the time. It was the longest suspension the NHL has ever given out in the playoffs for a hit. And I mean, if you ever I mean, I don't know how much of the 2011 Cup run you've seen between the Bruins and the Canucks, but that hit is pretty. It's hard to look at because Horton is on the ice and he's out cold and he's he's seizing. And that was the big thing was like, uh. Aaron Rome should be out for as many games as Horton is. And at the time it was kind of unknown if Horton would ever return to the league. And so listen, that was it. Had Aaron Rome not thrown that hit, we might've won the cup. That's like for real, like complete momentum changer against us. I can't say that I'm against it. I know it's, I know it sounds a little extreme, I think I think it's an interesting. I think there would be a way to implement it. I, you know, in like the the player safety hearings where they have appeals and they kind of have to like I don't want to say like show that the, what they did wasn't like premeditated, but they have to show like when you appeal a hit, like you have to be able to be like I was making an attempt to stop or disengage from the play or I was thinking about safety, blah blah blah. But some of these things that are just like blatant, like it's hard to it's hard to argue in Rempe's favor in that hit, in my opinion. And so I think if it's very plaintative, like, you clipped him up high, it was pretty obvious, or you very clearly, like, Hoaglander, I know, paid a fine, but let's just say he had injured, I still can't remember who he threw down, but let's just say he injured that Kevin guy. LeBanc. Kevin LeBanc, that's right, I always forget about Le- He's been waived, <laughs> that's why! <laughs> um, I don't blame you, he hasn't been in the lineup for, like, half the season anyway, so... <laughs> But like, what if what if that ended really bad for LeBanc, right? Like, what if like Hoagie like he really it, it wouldn't up have it? bothered our season. <laughs> but arguably, I'm obviously joking. <laughs> I would be concerned for LeBanc, but just but, trolling, I mean, just trolling the Sharks right now. <laughs> arguably, though, like if he would have cracked LeBanc's head open, let's just say he hit his head on the ice pretty hard. Let's say he cracked his head open. I mean, like I wouldn't have if, if the NHL would have been like LeBanc's out. For 45 games, and we're going to put Hoaglander out for 45 games because he cracked the skull open. I'd be like, that's fair. 
like in a completely unnecessary play, like where you can look at the play, you can look at the context that builds up to the play, the what happens after the play. If it's a play that results in a serious injury, player service, who you know, Department of Player Safety, player service, like it's the DMV, the <laughs> Department <laughs> Department of Player Safety. If they were to look at that player, and be like, he's concussed, he's out for the rest of the season. And that was a completely unnecessary play on your behalf, and you're out for the rest of the season too. I do think it would send a different message. I think that I think that it would stop things from like what happened with Rent because to a to a degree when you start co opting, I think like the physical nature of it and those players do know that they're making waves with that physical like I'm gonna get out there, I'm gonna throw bows, I'm gonna you know put the body down and make physical aggressive plays. In some sort of way, these players start looking for that engagement, right? They're like, this is the purpose that I am here to serve, that I'm doing a good job, so let me hit a bunch of people and get under everybody's skin, and that is inevitably how things escalate. Like, uh, Rempe, again, being a perfect example, like, he throws a pretty questionable, hard-to-justify up-high shot, you know, and and now he's suspended for however many games. But there's so many uh, episodes where, like, this sort of overt physicality of, of, you know, the code, that old chestnut, like, becoming this thing that leads to these sort of events. I think if it's if it's an egregious outwardly like unnecessary thing if player safety were to just be like hey he's out for three weeks and so are you i think it would send a different message i think players would would hopefully make more calculated gambles on physicality like are you are like if you're really are you really laying the body into this dude to help your team gain momentum or are you just pissed off that you're getting outplayed for 60 minutes and now you've just got you know, okay, well, I'm gonna hit, I, if I can't beat him, I might as well beat up on him. Okay, well, if that's if that's the case, you might not be able to beat him on the scoreboard. You're gonna play a physical game, take the body out of him. You still have to do that within the laws and the rules of the game, not just go out there and look for confrontation. So I think it would send a different message. And at this point, can anybody take this league seriously? Like if they just did it one time, right? I think it would be fun. I think it would be a good thing. They've done a lot of questionable shit. So why not just make them, you know, you do the crime, you do the time. So here are some of my <laughs> thoughts about why I don't like that thought. I get that in the moment, if, the, if in this game, if you're a New Jersey Devils fan, and let's say this was implemented, let's say that that was a thing where as long as Siegenthaler is out, Rempe, that's how many games that he gets suspended. It feels good from a Devils fan perspective. Because you're like, yeah, like, how dare you take our player out? And now, eye for an eye, we take you out as well. Um, I get from a fan base perspective that that would feel good in the moment. But I can't get away from the fact that we can't really trust the league, the players. You know, like, let's say, let's take, for instance, you know, already we, we get um, up in arms when, um, when there's a questionable hit or something like that. And you, you, you know, your social media floods with like, there was no intent to injure. And I'm just like, shut up. He's injured. Like, I don't care if there was like, oh, like, you know, like we've gone and talked about like Hoaglander. Like, I don't feel like Hoaglander meant to hurt LeBanc. But at the end of the day, LeBanc, you know, that happened. You've got to, you've, I, like, I, I, I want to say I like the approach where it's objective, where like, you, like, we're not going to go sit down with the player and be like, now, are you sorry? And they'll be like, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, because you're sorry, you don't get 10 games. We'll only give you two. You know, like, I feel like we get into a sticky situation if we start being like, oh, well, he didn't mean to do that. Or like, oh, that was an accidental thing. It wasn't on purpose. Like, when we start putting in, like, a subjective, um, and I'm not saying it needs to be one or the other, like, this whole this whole thing is complicated. So that's where I start getting concerned. Like, it's just going to open up more cans of worms. And on top of that, it's it's Rempe and McDermott. It's like, and well, I mean, obviously, Siegenthaler is a valuable defenseman for, for the Devils. But 
let's say it's like an Austin Matthews and you know, well, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I, I like Matthews might have some, some players out there. He's like, Oh, I wish I could take you out. But like, I've mentioned this before, like a couple of seasons back when Eric Carlson got two game suspension for head contact to someone he was checking. I don't personally feel like in that moment, Carlson, like he's not a dude that's going out there and taking out, you know, dudes like he gets incredibly passionate when he's out there. So I'm not saying that like, oh, no, this dude's totally level headed and he doesn't let the emotional side of the game get to him. Like he is a very passionate. He like yells at himself. Like, I don't know if you've seen the the clip or like the story that came out where uh, I think it was like one the first season or two that he was with the Sharks and he was paired up with Brendan Dillon, who's now on the Winnipeg Jets. And there was some play that happened and I guess there was an error or whatever. And you could hear on the clip that someone is saying like, fuck off, Carl. And whatever. And no one could figure out like who said that? Like, and everyone thought like, oh my God, like, him and Brendan Dillon are like, you know, clashing, like this deep pairing is toxic. Turns out, and I don't remember who like clarified it, but it wasn't Dillon. It was Carlson talking about himself because he's the one who made the error and he was telling himself to fuck off. (laughs) Can't relate. Yeah, so, you know, like all that to say, like, Let's say it's somebody who, and I feel like this is something that we're also like very frustrated with, where it seems like if it's some nobody player or some mid player, like it seems like the Department of Player Safety has no problem with laying down the law. But when it comes to someone who is, who could be pinnacle, who could, who could change the direction, like especially if you did it during playoffs, like let's say, a Quinn Hughes or something, you know, ends up hitting some guy like in the head, knocks him out for like the, like we could even go to like when the, I was trying to look this up earlier when like the Seattle Kraken, I think it has something to do with um, Kale McCarr and he ended up hitting somebody like boarding. And I don't remember if that led to anything, but you know, there's like these certain plays that happen related to, high caliber star players and there's times when they should have probably gotten like just as many games as some other dude that maybe it doesn't get as much ice time as them but it's like the same similar play and we go back to being all mad the department player safety is so inconsistent and it's like how are people gonna feel if like hypothetically we put this into motion that as long as this dude is out, that's how many games you get? What if it's something like an Austin Matthews, a Quinn Hughes, a Jack Hughes? Because even though these players are not really the type that are going out there for that purpose, the fact that this game is so fast, so physical, like at the end of the day, we still need to handle the head contact the same way, whether it's on purpose or by accident because we're trying to get this stuff out of the sport but then i was also thinking about how if you if you do something like that and people argue that like oh like oh this 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 sport is so wussy now because people can't take these hits how how much is it going to impact a player to be more like anxious to even throw a hit because they're going to accidentally like hit someone up high because of how fast they're going. I don't know. There, it, it, it doesn't make me feel like it's the best answer. And I can't say that I know what it is. All I know is that, um, yeah, like I, I want to kind of get these head contact stuff out, out of the sport. Like even with like, Someone like a Tom Wilson, that's something that I didn't trust for a while because everyone's like, oh, it's a good, clean hit, good, clean hit, and whatever. And I don't argue that it isn't a legal hit. It's just that he comes at you like 200 miles an hour. Like, how necessary is that to the point where the impact causes the player to be out? 
And so, and, and you had a couple of good points about that because look, at this point, I'm just used to the NHL's chaos. So if they were like, that's what we do, I'm like, yeah, why not? Let's give it a go. <laughs> um, but intense to injure, right? This is a fast-moving game. We all know this. It, there's a lot of physics. I think people don't realize how much like physics is actually in the sport of hockey. You have to keep up with this guy and this guy and this guy and this piece of puck, and you're on two-inch blades. And there's you have to be able to be in – the rules, especially of the game, expect you to be in full awareness of your body, your body positioning, where your stick's at. Is it too high? Is it on the ice? These guys are supposed to, I mean, your brain's already prop making 3 billion processes a second. And then you throw all that onto these guys on a sheet of ice. Intent to injure, I feel, is a very, very hard thing to prove, right? Because... Even if I'm coming at you, like, say, Jay, like, me and you are playing, and I'm coming at you, and I've got you lined up, and I take, like, two or three extra strides, maybe to close the gap a little bit quicker, but unknowns to me, now I've made the hit, like, you've got the puck, and I'm trying to finish my check in time and get there and close the gap, and maybe you pivot at the last second, and now I've made contact up high when my intention the whole time was a clean, you know, shoulder-to-chest sort of contact. It's so hard to prove intent to injure. Like, it really, because the game is so fast, and it moves so quickly. And I think, I, I mean, I, I can't, I don't know the NHL rule book, but I don't know if this exists. But what I would like to see, I think maybe that would help in these regards, is the NHL provide a definition of what is something that clearly displays intent to injure. Because one of the things, like one of the reasons why I don't really care for a guy like Tom Wilson is because of that. There is one thing to line up a guy and place a big check on him. There is a different sort of ferocity to coming out onto the ice and taking five or six, seven really hard, quick strides and then laying into the body of somebody. I understand you want to have a big physical impact, but to me, that sort of premeditation up to the con actual point of contact says that there was there was an intent to do something more than just throw a hockey hit, right? Like you're trying to do damage. And yeah, taking the body is a great way to slow your opponent down. That's like the physical aspect of what that purpose, you know, what that serves in hockey. But I think there does need to be some guidelines in the sport. So if the NHL were to do something wild and say like, he's out for 12 games because you clocked him cold. Now you're out for 12 games. And here is why we said like you had the intent to injure on that play, you know, and I know that there are some guidelines, like there's a call against charging, right? Like you're like, but we don't ever see charges get called that much in hockey. And going back to Tom Wilson, there's a lot of hits where I think it's, you could arguably make like, was that not charging? Like he literally got a turbo boost for he punted this dude through the wall. So I, I think that the, the league needs to define, like these are the things we look for and intent to injure. And that's why I said, when it comes down to these controversial hits and moments in these games, I like to look at the events, the immediate events before the immediate events after it. I like to have the context because it's not just that game doesn't just boil down to that one moment. Like, a shift in momentum might, but the whole game just doesn't boil down to that one moment. There's still 60 minutes of hockey there. Inevitably, something happened, or, you know, something was said in a chirp, and, and it led to the clown show at some point in time, right? It's an emotional game. We know these guys are emotional when they're out there. I think that the league needs to have a very plaintive definition of what they look at and says, like, this is vastly different from a regular check this was you actually trying to do damage and to, to second that they have to do it evenly across the board i think because you brought up a very good point the league treats different players differently and for checks that like if that had been Connor mcdavid that threw that hit that rimpe did would this even be having would we even be having a conversation about it on the podcast probably not because mcdavid nine times out of 10 most assuredly gets away with that. Even if it's high, it's like a two minute elbowing call, right? Like he probably doesn't get suspended for that. Well, why is that? McDavid, he generates profits. He's in the news. He's on headlines and he's on social media and he's in video games and he's got marketing and endorsements. He's a, he's a money maker. Does he, you know, he's like the NHL superstar. He, he drives that bottom line for this league. So God forbid they have to suspend Connor McDavid for four games. 
because well, what does that say about the league where we suspend a superstar? I think, I think it is absolutely. I think it's a huge, a huge oversight for the league to treat one player and their talents less than another player and his talents, even if they're not the same caliber. They all still work for you as a governing body of this sport. You're still their employer, and at the end of the day, like they still bring the same set of core talents and they still show up and do their job, right? They're hockey players. I, I think it's a, absolutely egregious to say, well, we won't punish him because he's a superstar and that could look bad on the league. But this guy over here is becoming a problem, so we have to handle him. No, there needs to be a clear definition of intent to injure, and it needs to be laid across all people. Whether you're the guy that makes $12 million a year or you're the guy that makes league minimum – it needs to be penalized the same. It is absolutely crazy to me that we can watch – and it happens, right? We've seen it happen. We've seen big-name guys get away with shit that if it had been somebody on the third or fourth line for an irrelevant team, they would be four, five, six, seven, however many games are getting a fine. The league has to be able to apply it evenly, and I think it is – I think it says a lot about – the league itself that they already don't do that we already have to have these conversations about well if that was so and so it would happen differently that's wild to me they're all hockey players they're all out there doing the same thing some of them do it better than others this is just a fact of life and every single workplace but if you are the top performer at your workplace and you show up late every single day it doesn't matter you're still going to get the same punishment as the dude that's a bottom level performer that shows up to work late every single day and so it's it, it as i don't know as a testament to their professionalism as a league as a whole like you have to start defining these things and they have to be applied equally amongst the fourth line guys and the headline guys right yeah you definitely do bring up a good point about the profit aspect of it um and I also wanted to bring up, so I saw this tweet talking about, um, I guess Ray Ferraro had said on, I think it's his segment or part of a podcast. I can't, I, I don't follow it, but I'm, I'm familiar with the name. Um, there was a user on, on Twitter who had put out the, the segment of what they were talking about saying that uh, Ray Ferraro just said on Ray and Driggs that if Rempe takes New Jersey Devils out with, um, with a dirty headshot and he refuses to answer the bell, <laughs> New Jersey should have just targeted three of the smaller or more talented Rangers for retribution. And I replied in response to this that, uh, after seeing like people underneath that tweet being like, yeah, yeah, that, that should be the answer. And they started naming certain players. And like, I make no secret that I'm a fan of the Rangers and some of the players that they mentioned, like, I was just having like not good feelings. And this could go to just any fan base in general. It's like, take any, you know, if, if this were to happen in a similar fashion, on like the Canucks and people are talking about like, Oh, they should take out like Pedersen. They should take out Quinn and blah, blah, blah. It's like just these, you know, because these guys will be, will hurt that fan base. Like that, or, you know, or like the team in general, it's like, people are talking about how that, like that makes sense. And I'm kind of like sitting back here being like, people are kind of, <laughs> People are kind of talking about this in a context where, like, these players, like, aren't real. Right. That, like, when you're watching this sport, it's, like, it it it's removed from reality that these players, like, are not actually going to, like, have long-term impacts to their quality of life. If you're just saying, well, the clear answer to this is, like, you just take out some of these other guys. Just, like, you know, just just picking them off of a list and being like, yeah, next game, take, take out Panarin, take out Zabatajad, take out, you know, yeah, like that makes sense. And I said in response, you know, it's clear that all involved, the NHL, the NHLPA, the Department of Player Safety need to address 
uh, coming down harder on headshots, dangerous hits, etc. Because frankly, this talk of targeting people to take them out of the game is becoming more and more disturbing. Yeah. And that's and that's what I was saying earlier. Is this stuff with Rempe? If the if the league doesn't have standards that they can apply evenly across the board, it already sends the wrong message, right? Because then it already greenlights. Well, well, they came after our superstar, so let's go after their superstar. An eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. But eventually, it shows up in these really, really just demonstrous sort of ways, right? These really consuming ways where it becomes less about the scoreboard the end result on the scoreboard and more about like well we got to get even against so and so because of what happened two or three days ago and the league didn't handle it correctly like it th- like you said these K- these guys are human first of all they're not like they, these aren't this isn't chell this is the real people on a real sheet of ice and what happens out there has real impacts and it if you can't stamp it out and get it under control or if you're going to go as far as as like we've seen with Rempe, people are really on board about, we need this, the Rangers need the tough guy like this, you come in and just throw both. It inevitably leads to all of this shit being blown out of proportion, and then these sort of discourses and discussions and debates happening around, like, well, how do we change the culture of hockey? And that's what I'm saying, is you can't both sides these kinds of debates. You either are like, okay, we clean up the culture, like, I'm not, I love fighting in hockey. I think there are moments when it's super appropriate, we've talked about it. But this kind of stuff inevitably leads to more just straight up bullshit down the road where these these sort of questions are proposed. Well, would it be egregious if, if a player was suspended for the same length as as an injury and and, you know, well, these players should be targeted in retribution because like Rempe didn't want to drop the gloves or McDermott didn't want to go, blah, blah, blah. It's wild. It turns into a soap opera. It's 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 hockey. <laughs> it's hockey, and it's up to the league to send a better message. Which, like I said, they want to try some chaotic shit, like everybody gets a suspension for as long as the length of an injury. Uh, I don't know; it would make more sense than some of the other decisions the NHL has made. But they've got it. You got to figure it out. You got to figure it out. And 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 co-opting this kind of goonery stuff, it, it inevitably leads to to more headlines. And, and and again, coming back to the, the, the profit driving bottom line that I was talking about, it kind of makes you wonder if some of the reasons why the NHL doesn't do things about it is because, well, it generates attention and attention generates content, which generates engagement, which generates dollars. Because if you don't think that there isn't some sort of of monetary gain or monetary incentive for this league to do that kind of stuff, you are incredibly naive, right? Like, like for anybody out there that doesn't think that there is on some level, like this isn't driven by profit. The NHL is a business. They generate billions with a B in revenue every year. So to an extent, it's either the league doesn't give a shit enough because they know it drives the content and the engagement in the bottom line, or it's just the league is just real broken, which it could be a combination of those two, to be quite honest. And the league just chooses to let it go because they want to play favorites and and what's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But the NHL has no idea what is even good for the duck, let alone the goose. <laughs> Thousand percent. Um, so I want to close out this segment with... Um... Because you had mentioned, you know, once again about like how it seems like the NHL is making these decisions based on like what's best for like their profits, and um, the the person who had who had tweeted out about what Ray Ferraro said also commented on my post and um, also brought up the fact that you know like Pinto was suspended for forty one games for when they found out that he was gambling. You know, so like that's bad for, you know, the the image and for, you know, the uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The integrity of the yeah. sport. Right. But, you know, you give this. So you're capable of suspending guys like a gazillion games for something that like impacts negatively to the financial aspect of of the game. And I want to say that in this season alone, it seems like they are starting to ramp up uh, the suspensions in terms of getting these headshots and, and, 
you know, these dangerous types of hits out of the game. I and and not so much using the favoritism, but it's yet to be seen. I think the highest that we've seen so far is with Morgan Riley's uh, four game suspension. But we'll see because someone like a McDavid, a Matthews, you know, something like this hasn't come up. And, you know, that's good that they they haven't been in situations like this from my recollection. Um, but it is like, we've already mentioned, it is easier to be like, Oh yeah. Like this random, no guy, like, yeah, give them 10 games. Who gives a shit? No one's going to remember. People are just going to be a little upset, but at the end of the day, you know, we've got a McDavid and a, and an Austin Matthews out there like to distract them. So they have the capability of it. It, it does seem sort of like they aren't taking these, these, uh, dangerous, aspects of the game as seriously as they can and if anything maybe they just need to start coming down harder with a higher number of suspensions just to really give these players something to think about because I feel like I want to hope that in these four games that Rempe has been unable to, unable to play hopefully he's starting to think about it and start and you know if it really was accidental on his part I don't know. I I would feel like that make more sense if it was like some random beer leaguer who just like doesn't know their body. Right. But right. Rempe's a fucking professional, so it's hard for me to believe that like oh he doesn't realize that there's other ways to in, to brace for his impact going into the boards. Um, but I want to hope that this should have come down sooner. But now they have to hopefully realize they have to address it for the New York Rangers that they sit down with Rempe and they're like, mm. <laughs> so, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the sharks because we've, we, we talked about this on the last episode between uh, me and Nessa, but there was a article that got put out in regards to how the sharks have the first rounder for the penguins that we got in our trade with Eric Carlson and it is a top 10 protected, but I'm sure the, well, the penguins probably expected that they'd be much better this season. Um, And they're not, who knows? Yeah. It just seems like, it just seems like didn't no one see what we were trying to do over here in San Jose. Did you see this and be like, that's a great idea. Like, no, it's not a great idea. Like locking in and holding on to your aging players and just trying to get that last run in is kind of what I feel like they were doing when they acquired Eric Carlson. And so for this draft pick, um, they have the option. Uh, I, I think it, I think there's a time frame that you can make this change leading up to the to the draft that if they end up like missing the playoffs, uh, I, th- I think it was put out if if they well, the season ended at that time of this article, the Penguins would have the eighth overall pick, hypothetically. Yeah. Um, so if they decided, you know, we actually want that draft pick back this season, then our first round pick from them would turn into an unprotected first round pick next season. So this excerpt from that article says if, if Pittsburgh after lottery is 11th or worse in the draft order, it's first, it's first round pick will automatically go to San Jose as a condition of last season, summer's Eric Carlson trade, but Dubas could still elect to send that pick to counterpart Mike Greer. If it is in the latter half of the drafts orders, top 10. That's because if the Penguins do not send their first round to the Sharks this season, they would send their 2025 first round pick instead. And if this season represents the start of the Pittsburgh's downward spiral after so many years of excellence, Dubas may want to hold on to the first rounder next year. Um, and so I've been really interested to see that if the Penguins elect to allow us to have the draft. Uh, pick for this season that there there's i i'm starting to get on the hype train with like i used to not really follow uh the draft really in any big capacity like uh, i would just kind of wait for 
the whoever the sharks ended up picking and then i would get excited after the fact but you know we're in a bit of a different situation right now in san jose and it's become something that i've been getting really interested in too because we're looking towards the future and i want to get excited for these new guys and you know after this trade deadline like so much has changed on the roster that it, you know i get that everyone is still going through the trade to Vegas. I kind of feel like I have been already on on the farewell boat for Hurdle ever since he that season where his contract was up and I was in the opinion that we should have had never given him that contract. So I've already feel like I've kind of gone over that hump in terms of seeing him go, uh, but I am still recovering from where he ended up going. <laughs> yeah. Man, that one, I was hurt for you guys. Like, when I seen that trade, I was like, oh, God. Like, like of all the places that hurt, I, I we talked about it before, I love Hurdle. I mean, I've, I've loved him ever since his four goals. Like, I just love, I don't know, he, he's an infectious guy. And so when I found out that he ended up in Vegas, I seen that news, and I was like, oh, God. Like, anywhere, like, 31, you know, 30, however many other teams, and uh, to Vegas he goes. But. I and 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 I will say that uh, getting into like when you inevitably go through a rebuild, it's really fun to get like that's when when I started getting into the draft and to prospects is when the Canucks you know started sort of self correcting after that like last twenty fourteen playoff run we had. Um, it's fun. It's fun to see like like watch the prospects and get an idea of like how this team is going to look in the future. Like, are we going to build for speed? Are we building for size? Are we building around like best player available? And, and, and how are we going to mold this team to compete? And like, what's this team's new identity? Um, I think that's, I think it's really, I think it's a good and healthy that you have embraced that Jay, because it does help. It helps you keep, keep yourself positive whenever the result, you know, in the, in the regular season is, is rough. And when you have to part with a guy like like Hurdle or LeBanc, LeBanc, <laughs> <laughs> I want to make his name so fancy sounding every time I say it. <laughs> well, you only have so many games to continue talking about him because he his contract is up this season, and the writing is on the wall that we are done and over with the LeBanc. I at this point I do feel kind of bad for him, but um he is getting paid like four point uh, upside of five. Hmm. So uh, you know, as as much as I feel bad that he hasn't played in like he's probably I want it. I'm not even confident he's played in half the games this season. Like he's been basically stapled to the press box. Um Oof. But I mean, he's getting paid, you know, and at the end of the day, it's like I, I, I can't really feel too sorry for someone who's making like millions of dollars. So, uh, but um, I yeah, so I, I'm really interested to see what Kyle Dubas does uh, for this this offseason because whew, I have Jari on one of my uh fantasy teams and it has been rough yeah <laughs> it has been rough that team is there i don't know what's happening and i i will say that when they made the trade to the penguins i was kind of unsure how that was going to work because they have chris letang like and i know they're not like on the same caliber in terms of like you know Carlson North Trophy and and all this stuff, but Latang is still like their top defenseman who's been on their power play unit for you know a good number of seasons, from what I can tell. And when we got Carlson, it was because we kind of had to do something. Ever you know when uh, Tavares went to the Leafs, that was who we wanted. But when he went there, we were like, but Carlson's up for you know, might as well jump in there and get the big fish right it 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 wasn't what we wanted but it made sense to do it but then we the first season they they were trying to figure out like how to handle him and burns 
Mm. And they tried them both for a while in the power play. And then they tried, like, I think it was this dynamic of, like, we don't want to, like, obviously Burns is our top defenseman. But Carlson is the guy who, like, is probably going to work the best on our power play. And I just feel like it just, it caused this unspoken, I don't believe it was between the players. It was more just, like, how to figure out the lineup. And I right. think, like, two of these, like, very impactful defensemen who would be the number one on any team, the fact that they're both there, like, how do you work that dynamic? I just feel like, at the end of the day, it ended up, like, causing more issues than it really uh, was worth it. And then, as you saw, we shipped out Burns this past uh, uh, season, and Carlson went on a huge run. It might be coincidental. Who knows? We don't know what goes on uh, beyond what we see uh, from from the media and from what the Sharks tell us. But that was kind of what I felt when they acquired Carlson. Like, how is that going to work with Tang? And it, it doesn't seem like it has. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't. So all that to say they didn't expect themselves to be in this situation, but it is a protected uh, top 10 and who's to say next season with it being unprotected if the penguins would find themselves in the same situation where we could end up getting some uh, a pick within the top 10 but i am really interested to see what what dubas does because that would be really great if the penguins continue to suck and <laughs> and their pick ends up being you know much higher in the draft pick because just looking at all of this like information coming out about some of the other players that could be picked in in those in those spots, uh, I mean, I know we're all tanking for Celebrini at this point. There's still some other guys that have like been mentioned. Like even if the Sharks don't end up getting the first overall pick, there's there's a couple of like top defensemen who could be really great to pick at like the second and third spot. But it'd be really great if we got two picks in the top 10 that would be so excellent for a team that's like really needs to put together a rebuild and really needs like a just a good i don't want to say restart but just like a good like a good jump start into putting together something for a new long-term identity i mean because like my team just did it however many years ago so i totally understand where you guys are at as a team as a fan base and and we went into the Benning era with like like a Benning rebuild with like no draft picks. Like there was just like that was the like the Jim Benning era in Vancouver was notorious for not having anybody in the pipeline or anybody to really build around that was talent of our own that we had molded into our prodigal son of Canucks hockey. So I think that that's like it would be dope for you guys. I would live. If I, would you rather have two top ten picks or ten thousand Yamir Yager bobbleheads? <laughs> that is just so silly how that happened um what the hell is going on in pittsburgh y'all <laughs> trying so hard to distract the fans from a terrible season and someone's like nope we'll take those baubles <laughs> nope no fun for you um, I do want to mention um, from this TSN article that was put out by Bob McKenzie talking about, you know, the projected top players for, for the draft. We all know about Celebrini, but I'm also trying to pr protect myself from if that team in Chicago yet again gets it. Mm -hmm. But um, the, <laughs> from... His projections, the person who might go second overall is this Russian defenseman, Anton Silayev. And he seems more like on the, really good on his defensive game. But the thing that stuck out to me was that he is six, six foot seven. Good God. And I was like, Oh my God! Can you imagine if he is on the blue line with Shakir Mukhvadulin? <laughs> we would have our own D pair of giraffes. Yeah, 
Everybody needs a, gir- a, gira- a defenseman giraffe. I think that that's a, the best trend in hockey. We have, of course, our chaos giraffe, but then we also have Zadorov, who I like to, you know, he's like security giraffe. That's how it feels when Zadorov's on the ice for us. So it's I. Every every good team that needs a new identity needs their own wildlife adjacent defenseman. I think that's just a good puzzle piece. To uh, everybody loves size on the blue line. Well, why not? Why not bring the zoo home? <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's all the thoughts that I kind of have on on the upcoming draft. I'm just trying to get excited for it. like a lot of like even in this short period of time. Uh, since the since the trade deadline, we we acquired a couple of young pieces that some of them already kind of are starting to shine, you know, in our roster in just such a short period of time. Clem Costin that we picked up from the Red Wings, we moved. Redeem Shimmick, he was always going to be moved, and it just kind of forgot about it because he he had gotten sent down to the AHL for like majority of the season. Uh, I wish Redeem well. I hope that he finds his way back, you know, with the big club. But what we got in return is something that we definitely need. And in the first, like, handful of games that he's been here, he's already gotten, like, three points. Um, So it's gotten me excited with, like, yeah. Yeah, that's right? what that's what we need. Um, And on top of that, we we shipped out Kapokokkanen and... We got uh you got I feel really terrible. Van Van I van a sec- Vanacek. There we Vanacek, go. I was like drawing right. a black. All because the goalie I want to get around to saying is that we acquired Devin Cooley. I don't remember who we sent out uh to to get him, but the just the just the good feels behind acquiring Cooley, who's from a, a town that's literally just like five or so miles away from me grew up the in the junior sharks organization and now today as of this recording he's gonna get his first nhl start way to go in the damn jersey of the team he grew up rooting for i don't care that we have only gotten 16 wins in this season i am living for this moment and it it and it causes me to have conflicting thoughts that we're going against the Blackhawks. We should just lose this game because it was just like work in our favor. But I want to see Cooley get this win. And so hopefully by the time everyone's listening to this, he has gotten the win because what an amazing, just good feels for this fan base to watch one of our own get to the, get to, Stand between the pipes. Hopefully, get to come home with a win. His very first appearance uh, in the NHL, uh, representing the team that that made him fall in love with the sport. That's awesome. that is the feels that are driving the 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 inevitable end of this season, where we say yet again, no go to the playoff, but we look towards the future, look towards the draft, look towards you know all of these all these components that we've brought in and starting to recreate the future of this franchise and and i will say to the sharks fan base and to and to you jay as well uh the iceman right their nhl affiliate is the sabers and so rochester is their ahl stop devin cooley has been on my radar since the beginning of the season with his dealings inside the Buffalo, the Rochester pipeline, because there's been a whole lot of movement. I didn't know if we could see Cooley in net and chance for us in Jacksonville anytime. So he was somebody that I was watching. You guys got a good one, man. He's that, that goaltender has everything in the works to be an absolute stud and to hold down the net for San Jose. And uh, I was, I was stoked to see, Devin get a chance to end up with a big club where hopefully he can come in and he can make a great impact, you know, especially even if it's just to get established for this little run here at the end of the season, but to actually be able to get in and and do something for a team that really 
you know, I'm not not trying to knock anybody that you guys have, but you you really are in the middle of that like retooling, rebuilding process. You, you have to reform that identity, and I think a big piece of that is good goalkeeping. I definitely think you guys have that, and Devin Cooley, super super stoked for him. I did not know he was from the Bay Area until you dropped that nugget of knowledge. So that is like so full circle, big picture. I love it. Stoked for him and stoked for you guys. Like Sharks fans, for real. You got a good one. Nice. Good to know. Good to know. Um, with that said, you wanna you wanna let the folks know about what your Jacksonville Icemen have got going on on their 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 good. Speaking of good vibes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I uh, this thing was uh, this was a little. Uh, you guys, you can you can find it on their Twitter page. You can find it probably on their other social medias. Um, I'm not sure what started this exactly. Um, the Icemen have been doing a great job of trying to get like more content with the players and and make more uh, player inclusive content, which is uh, that was a weird way to word that, but uh, it's really <laughs> it's really nice to see because I listen, I love my boys, but sometimes I'm like man, I don't know who has the worst. Like, do the ECHL players have zero personality or is it the NHL players? So it's been really nice to see the personality of our Iceman put on display. If any of you are familiar with, like, the Scream movies and the and the Friday, the was or not, not the Scream, the ones that were the parody of Scream. The parody. The up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what's up? And if you've watched Letterkenny, where they're voting against McMurray, and this is like Wayne's campaign ad. The Icemen have done a what's up video. And it is hands down one of the funniest things I've seen. One of the best pieces of content that this team has put out. And uh, nothing cracks me up like seeing like like Mackenzie Dwyer in full pads. And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, just selling tickets. It's like, <laughs> it's a, yeah, I know it's for sure on their, their Twitter, their ex. Uh, I think my mom had come across it on TikTok as well. So it's out there. But um just hilarious it's just it's just one of those little nuggets of of happiness that this team has brought me and um if you guys can find it i think i retweeted it on twitter so if you guys just want to go on there I, I have it up it's hilarious one of the best 54 second videos that this team has has put out what's up <laughs> and we are always rooting for more, more personality to be shined from the, from these players because we know that they've got stuff. They're just hockey culture is just kind of have them focusing more on just playing the game and and talking like a robot and you know pucks in deep. and all that. Yeah, pucks in deep, <laughs> uh, full sixty minutes, all four whatever. lines rolling. <laughs> Got to play our game. So. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the Eisman, just, you know, from what you kind of like talked about. But this in itself, this is kind of like what gets you excited about teams like uh, like we you know, we've had guests on this show and just amongst ourselves. Like, it's great to hear about how someone has gotten into the sport, how they chose a team. And this is, you know, this is good for, you know, the Iceman to put out some content like this, get get folks who might otherwise not know anything about hockey come across it one day. Like this is one of the reasons why like I started getting really into like the San Francisco giants and, you know, the local baseball team, the, the, uh, um, they, they have these personalities on, on the roster and they're not afraid to like put it out there. And I, and I want to, I want to say that these other sports are probably like more, willing to have their their players like you know shine and, and do all this stuff and hopefully the nhl and you know the hockey leagues as a whole are kind of coming around to that it it mm, like it, they could do a whole lot more but um not to end on on <laughs> this particular not to end on this particular team but i did want to mention as much as i am not a Boston Bruins fan. Oh. God, God, I I hate how good their socials are though. Oh. And I and like I don't I don't have a TikTok account and like I'm continuing to like 
to get nowhere near that. But every Same. so often, someone will retweet it with with the content that they've put out there, or maybe they've gotten from like Instagram or whatever. And I'm just like, God damn it, that's good. That made me laugh. That was great. <laughs> God damn you. Uh, on top of their their goalie tandem, I'm just like, God damn it. I don't want to like the Boston Bruins. But there was a video that came out, and I don't know where it came from, and I don't care. It is Brad Marchand and um, Swayman, Jeremy Swayman. They're like in cowboy hats or something like that and they're like in like big jackets and they're like in some store or whatever and they're just seeing they're like mouth like lip syncing to some song and like the social guys are just kind of like clipping them together it looks like a freaking like boy band you know entrance and i was laughing my ass off and i was just like and after i'm done laughing i'm like god damn it these boston Bruins. (laughs) Bruins. <laughs> I, I I know I harp on the Bruins, and I think if your team loses to a team in the Stanley Cup Finals, it's always gonna you're always gonna have that little bit of like those damn guys. But I over recent years, I will say I have really come to appreciate the collection of personality that does reside on the Boston Bruins roster. And I love I love these videos. So the same reason that I love the Iceman video is it just like it's so interesting to see the players that like take part in these in these interactions and these videos and these you know fun little social media things because it lets their personality come out. Man, Marshawn, I know Marshawn's a funny guy. Like I think we brought it up before, like where he like kissed Bergeron at somebody's wedding. Like he's he's a fun guy, full of personality. Anyway, this video with him and Swayman. I was dying laughing. I was laughing as equally hard as I was at the Bruins one over about the, like the Iceman one. So, um, yeah, I love it. I love it. And as much as I don't, as much as like thinking fondly of the Boston Bruins gives me indigestion, it's just, <laughs> <sighs> I, I do, I do enjoy their social content and they have, they have players that aren't afraid to show their personality out there for the, for, you know, the wide fan base in the world at large to see. And, uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. That I, I really love the, the personality of the Bruins goalies anyway, like Swayman and their whole thing. But that was a, that was a good combination of two dudes that normally bring a little bit of like their own flavor to, you know, the ice and everything else to a really funny, just clip it would have been so much more funnier had it been both of the bruins goalies in that clip i think that would have been all ideal the internet would have broke yes i think they realized that that's why they didn't do it um and have you seen so they so the bruins acquired pat maroon and i don't remember the exact incident but there was a certain incident that it the fact that they acquired him was like oh how's that gonna go with like the players involved in that one incident where I think they got into a fight or something with Pat Maroon yeah. at some point. And, and they totally took that and twisted it. They had a video where Pat Maroon's going, Hey, and then they have like different players, like reacting to him being like there. And one of the first players they had in that, in that clip was Brad Martian and he turns around, he's got his hand on his hip and he just has this very like animated, concerned look like, what are you doing here? And I'm just like, stop, just <laughs> stop. Oh my God. And like other players were being like, what the? you know, like just, and he just, and constantly coming back to Maroon and he's like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and it's just like, come on guys, e- you know, other social media uh, platforms for all these different teams and, and all the way down to the, to the, to the junior teams, like get, get some of this onto your platform. It is what the people want. For sure. They might be hockey players and first and foremost, even to themselves and to the rest of the world, but they are still, well, the most of them, the majority of them, are multifaceted individuals. They have things that they like outside of hockey. Please, please encourage your players and please build your players up to let them share that with us because it is always, 
the most beautiful thing. I, I love it. I love getting to see those glimpses of the guys, you know, behind the guys behind the bucket, the guys outside of the skates. Right. I, I love that. I, it's uh, we need we need more of that and less more like. That's to this code of, talk and right, answer right. the bell. That, that old chestnut. We don't need any more of that. Yeah. <laughs> more personality, less code. Re reinvent the code. The code needs to be like, you need to have more personality. <laughs> <laughs> Being in the locker room with you is like sharing the locker room space with soggy cardboard. Can't have that. <laughs> At least put some stickers on that thing. <laughs> All right. Wow, we have talked quite a bit, and I feel like we talked for like a whole half hour about Rente. But you know what? We had some thoughts, and we put them out there. And if you've made it this far, we thank you so much for, for joining us today. And, you know, as always, I am your host, Jay. I am your host, Drew. And if you did make it and this far, stay hydrated. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.